Hello, my amazing children. This is Grandma Carla, and I am going to read a brand new story called Star of Light by Patricia St. John. And I've wanted to read this book for a long time, and so now I get a chance. In the book, you can see what a cool picture it is. Doesn't look like this is in our time and place, does it? Hmm. Introductory note. If you look at a map of North Africa, you will see that at the northwest corner, the waters of the Mediterranean mingle with the wild tides of the Atlantic. The great Atlantic beaches stretch for miles and miles with the waves crashing and thundering on vast tracts of unbroken sand. Occasionally, a seawall has been built with a little town sheltering behind it, but for the most part is a lonely shore rising into sand dunes and backed by mountains. These mountains reach right back as far as the Mediterranean coast and run in a mighty range overlooking those still blue waters. Very high are some of these mountains, snow-capped until early summer, clothed with pine trees and stunted junipers. Others are merely high grassy hills or bare rocky peaks flanked by orchids and olive trees, and among the olive trees squat the villages, clumps of mud-thatched hutched huts, as well with a well in the center and a prickly pear hedge to mark the boundaries. Part one. Chapter one. Kinza, which means treasure. So here's the picture. A little girl came running down the side of the mountain one noon in spring. Gathering her cotton dress around her legs, she skipped as lightly as a lamb on her bare brown feet, leaping over drifts of wild marigold. In the water meadows below her, the bl plum blossom was out, and from the hilltop above it looked like a sea of white foam along the river banks. Baby goats skipped among the flowers, and the storks had begun to build on top of the roofs. Everything was busy and bright. The children all over the mountain stirred to the mood of spring, and leaped and shouted and ran. Rama, who had taken a shortcut across the hillside, reached the path with the bound, and went on dancing down it. She was seven years old, small because she seldom had enough to eat. Her stepfather and the elder wife disliked her and sometimes beat her. Her clothes were very ragged, and she worked as hard as the mother of a family might work, yet all her troubles could not dim the radiance of her joy when a treat occasionally came her way. And today, well, of today we shall see, she was to look after the goats alone while her brother went on some mysterious expedition with their mother. Free and alone for two whole hours with no other company but the storks and the goats. Two whole hours to play in the sunshine with the kids and no one could scold her and make her grind the millstone or carry heavy buckets of water. Her tired body, released, felt as light as a wisp of cloud and the marigolds and the sparkling river and the sunshine seemed to build up a golden world around her. On it, no dreary future could cast a shadow. She spied her brother from afar, rounding up a couple of mischievous young kids who were trying to get into a patch of young wheat. Spring was making them feel crazy, and they sh skipped in every direction except the right one, giving merry little bleats and leaping high in the air. I guess you've guessed now that baby goats are called kids. We use kids a lot when we're talking about children, don't we? But they're talking about baby goats. Hamid, their keeper, did not mind at all, for he felt exactly as they did. At the margin of the field of young wheat, the, tree, the three of them pranced together. Rama came bounding in among them, her smooth dark hair blown in wisps about her face, and her black eyes were very bright. Laughing and shouting together, they steered the kids onto the open hillside where the rest of the flock were scattered. 
Then Hamid turned, surprised to see his happy little sister. He had not often seen her so gay and free, for country girls are taught to walk sedately and to listen to their elders and superiors. Besides, Rama was seven years old and almost a little woman. What have you come for, he asked. To look after the goats, mother wants you. Why? I don't know. She wants you to go somewhere. She has been crying and looking at little sister. I think perhaps little sister is ill. Her sparkling eyes clouded as she remembered her mother's tears, for she loved her mother. Only the sunshine and freedom had made her forget all about them. Besides, her mother often wept when no one but Rama was with her, so Rama was almost used to it. All right, said Hammond, but take good care of the goats. Here's a stick for you. And he turned away and climbed the valley between the two green arms of the mountains. He walked fast because he did not want to keep his mother waiting. But he did not skip or look about him as Rama had done, for his mind was full of wondering. Why did his mother look so worried these days, as though she were carrying some secret load of fear? And why was she always hiding away his baby sister, keeping her out of sight whenever she heard her husband or the older wife approaching? Of course, neither of them had ever particularly liked baby sister, but they knew she was there, so why hide her? Mother even seemed afraid of him, and Rama playing with her baby nowadays. She would drive them away and retreat into a corner of the room, her little daughter clasped against her, and always that fear in her eyes. Was it evil spirits she feared? Or poison? Hammond did not know, but perhaps today his mother would tell him. He walked faster. He sighed as he climbed the hill, because until a few months ago his mother had never looked frightened. He and Rama had never been knocked out or considered in, knocked about or considered in the way. They had lived with their mother and their very own father who loved them in a little thatched home down the valley. There had been three other brown tousled headed children younger than Rama, but they had started coughing and grown thin. When the snow fell and the fuel and the bread were scarce, they grew weaker and died within a few weeks of each other. Their little bodies were buried on the eastern slope of the mountain facing the sunrise, and marigolds and daisies sprang up on their graves. Their father coughed that winter too, but no one took any notice, because after all, a man must earn his living. So he went on working and plowed his spring fields and sowed his grain. Then he came home one night and said he could work no more. Until the following autumn, he lay on a rush mat and grew weaker. Zora, his wife, and Hamid and Rama gathered in the ripened corn and gleaned what they could in order to buy him food, but it was no use. Then he died, leaving his wife, still young and beautiful, a penniless widow with two little children. They sold the house and the goat and the hens and the patch of corn and went to live with the grandmother until a few months later. Little sister was born, bringing fresh hope and sunshine to the stricken little family. They called her Kinza, which means treasure, and never was a baby more loved or fondled. Yet, strange to say, the wee thing never played or clapped her hands like other babies. She slept a great deal and often seemed to lie staring at nothing. Hamid sometimes wondered why the bunches of bright flowers he picked for her seemed to give her no pleasure. When Kenza was a few months old, there came a fresh offer of marriage for their mother, and she accepted at once, because she had no work and no more money to buy bread for her two children, and the family moved to their new home. It was not a very happy home. Sai Mohammed, the husband, was already married to an older wife, but she had never had any children, so he wanted another. He did not mind taking Hamid too, because a boy of nine would be useful in looking after the goats, nor did he object to Rama, because a girl of seven can be useful little slave about the house. But he could not see that a baby was the slightest use to any of them, and he wished to give Kenza away. Many childless women would be glad of a girl, he said, and why should I bring up another man's baby? But young Zora had burst into weeping and refused to do any work until he changed his mind. So he rather 
sullenly agreed to let Kenza stay for a time. No more was said about it, unless perhaps something had been said during the past few weeks, something that Hamid and Rama had not heard. Could that be why their mother held Kenza so close and looked so frightened? A voice above him called to him to run, and he looked up. His mother was standing under an old, twisted olive tree that flung its shade over a well. She carried two buckets in her hand, but she had not filled them, and baby Kenza was tied on her back with a cloth. She seemed in a great hurry about something. Come quick, Hamid, she said impatiently. How slowly you come up the path. Hide the buckets in the bushes. I only brought them as an excuse to leave the house in case Fatima should want to know why I was going. Now come with me. Where to, mother? asked the little boy, very surprised. Wait till we get around the corner of the mountain, replied his mother, leading the way up the steep green grass and walking very fast. People will see us from the well and will tell Fatima where we have gone. Follow quickly. I'll soon tell you. They hurried on until they had turned the corner of the arm of the mountain and were hidden from the village and were overlooking another valley. The young mother sat down, unhitched her cloth, and laid her baby in her lap. Look well at her, Hamid, she said. Play with her and show her the flowers. Hamid, wondering, stared long and earnestly into the strange, old, patient face of his little sister. But she did not stare back or return his smile. She seemed to be looking at something very far away and not to see him at all. With a sudden thrill of fear, he flicked his hand in front of her eyes, but she never moved nor blinked. She's blind, he whispered at last. His lips felt dry and his face was rather white. His mother nodded and rose quickly to her feet. Yes, she replied, she's blind. I've known it for some time, but I've kept it from Fatima and my husband because when they know, they will probably take her away from me. Why should they be bothered with another man's blind child? She can never work and she will never marry. Her voice broke and blinded by her tears, she stumbled a little on the rough track. Hamid caught her arm. Where are you going, mother? He inquired again. To the saint's tomb, answered his mother, hurrying on up behind the next hill. They say he is a very powerful saint and has healed many, but Fatima has never before given me the chance to go. Now she thinks I'm drawing water and we must return with the buckets full. I wanted you to come with me because it's a lonely path and I was afraid to go by myself. They climbed in silence, too breathless to talk any more. Here, hollowed from a boulder, was a small cave shaded by a bush. The bush was festooned with dirty little screws of paper tied to its branches, and every little screw carried its tale of sorrow. The sick, the brokenhearted, the childless, the unloved, all brought their burdens to the bones of this dead man, and they all went home unhealed and uncomforted. They laid little sister at the mouth of the cave, and the mother bowed down and lifted her up again, calling on the name of a god about whom she knew nothing, and on the prophet Mohammed. It was her last hope, but as she prayed, a cloud passed across the sun, and a cold shadow fell on the baby. She shivered and began to cry, and groped for her mother's arms. The woman gazed eagerly into her daughter's face for a moment and then picked her up with a disappointed sigh. God had not listened, for Kenza was still blind. Hamid rose from the path of marigolds on which he had been squatting, and he and his mother almost ran down the hill. They were late, and then already the sun was setting behind the mountains. The storks flew past with their rattling cry, black against the rosy west, and Hamid, Hamid rebellious and bitterly disappointed, scowled at the world which was bathed in the last glow of that beautiful light. Radiance of marigolds, tenderness of young green wheat, brightness of sunset skies. What was the good of them all? Little sister would never see them. God apparently did not care, and the dead saint would do nothing to help. Perhaps baby girls were beneath his notice. 
They reached the well in silence, and Hamid drew the water for his mother, gave her the buckets, and dashed off down the valley to collect Rama and the goats. He met them halfway up the hill, for Rama was afraid of the lengthening shadows and wanted to go home. She slipped her small hand into his, and the goats, who also wanted to go home, huddled against their legs. Where did you go? asked Rama. To the saint's tomb, answered Hamid. Rama, little sister is blind. Her eyes see nothing but darkness. That's why mother hides her away. She does not want Fatima and, and Sai Muhammad to know. Rama stood still, horrified. Blind? She echoed, and then as the thought struck her, she added quickly, And the saint couldn't make her see? Hamid shook his head. I don't think that saint is much good, he said rather boldly. Mother went there before when father coughed, but nothing happened. Father died. It is the will of God, said Rama, and she shrugged her shoulders and spread out her hands with a hopeless little gesture, as much as to say, there is nothing more we can do about it. Then clinging close together, because night was falling, they climbed the hill and the goat's eyes gleamed like green lanterns in the dusk. I hate the dark, whispered Rama with a little shiver, but Hammond stared up into the sky, deep blue through a filigree of olive leaves. I love the stars, he said. That is the end of chapter one. And next time we will read chapter two, The Discovery. This is Grandma Carla, and I love you.